Stuart will explore some of the other solutions you have available to you today, some of which you may be using, and we'll talk about some of the problems associated with those other solutions. And following that, and where we would like to spend the majority of our time today, we'll do a live demo where we can explore APEX. I'll show you some of the basics. And we'll even build an application from a spreadsheet. Go ahead and get started. To begin with, I want to answer the all-important question, what is Application Express, or APEX? Well, simply put, it's a web-based application used to build web-based applications. APEX is a complete browser-based application development environment. And this is true both while you're developing and running applications. There's no client software required. And this can be a big advantage if you've ever worked with some other development environments. Not only did you have to configure the server side of things, you also had to install some software locally on your machine. And there's some problems associated with that. Not so with Application Express. Everything you need to develop the application can be done via the browser. A word that's often associated with Apex is declarative. And this just means that we use lots of wizards to create applications and other components, such as pages and items on those pages. And subsequently, we use definition screens to modify various attributes to get things exactly the way we want them. This declarative approach makes Apex easy to enhance and maintain as everything is presented in a consistent manner for all users. When I think of Apex, I like to think that it fills a void between Access and Java. On the one hand, Java, I'm sorry, Access is very simple to use, but it's limited and its features. On the other side, Java, which is not at all limited in its features, is so complex that it usually takes a lot of time and resources to produce any results. Apex, on the other hand, is both easy to use and feature rich. Apex is built directly into the Oracle database, so it's easy to integrate with other database features, some of which we'll take a look at a little later. SQL and PLSQL are the main languages used when developing an Oracle. So experience with these languages can be very useful when developing an Apex, but it's not required. Apex is a standard component of the Oracle database and has been since the release of 10G Express Edition. Now with Oracle Database 11G going forward, all versions will come with Apex ready to go. The version bundled with the database may be outdated as Apex is released more frequently than the database. So if that's the case, it's important to go ahead and upgrade as soon as possible. And this is something that the Apex team has made very easy to do. Apex is fully supported. There's a dedicated support team at Oracle which specializes in Oracle Forms and Apex alone. It's a no-cost option for the Oracle database. What that means is you can develop as many applications as you like with as many users as long as it's within the existing Oracle database license terms. So it depends on if you have a, a CPU or a named user license. What we see here is a high-level overview of the architecture used in Apex. And this is really three parts. On the left, we have the web browser, the client side. And on the far right, a database with Application Express installed. And between the two and connecting the two is a web listener. The exact configuration of that web listener can vary. Right now, there's two options. 
and there'll soon be a third. But the basic idea is the same no matter how that web listener is configured. The web browser or the user requests a web page by usually clicking a link or just going to a URL. That request goes through the web listener which forwards it over to Apex within the database. Apex uses the metadata about your application as well as the data from your other schemas, your other database tables. It uses all that information to generate a web page which it then sends back to the browser through the web listener. And this is the same on all versions of Oracle from 9i R2 or better. Apex was designed to support multi-tenant hosting from the beginning. Here we see an image. This is a typical architecture where an organization is broken down into multiple departments. And you can see that across the very top. Each department has its own needs and thus its own applications. How that maps to Apex can be seen at the next level down where you see each department mapped to an individual workspace within Application Express. A workspace is really just an independent development environment. So what I do in one workspace does not affect the others. You can also see that a workspace is mapped to schemas within the database. There's a one-to-many relationship. In the case of Workspace 2, that's mapped to two schemas. So this is the basic architecture most organizations will use when working with Apex. Organizations are doing the right thing when using the enterprise database, which is managed by IT. It's backed up, secure, and scalable. But today, more is required to break down isolated applications and data silos to provide cross-application integration, reporting, etc. We need to be able to build new applications as quickly as the market moves, and at the same time, we need to ensure all obligations are satisfied in regards to data access for compliance. We all know today's IT budgets are shrinking, so we need to be able to work smarter to meet these demands. Pardon me, Dan. We have a question in the queue. Sure. And uh, Candace is asking, can one schema be used in different workspaces? Absolutely. In fact, let me go back a couple. I think this. No, it was not done in this instance, but absolutely, you can certainly do that. Not a problem with an Apex. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not at this time. All right. So here we see a graphic that displays the sweet spot or target development for Apex. And starting on the bottom left, we have productivity or desktop databases, including Access and Excel. We go into a middle tier where we have a rapid application development and up top these OO frameworks, usually associated with the enterprise developer. And I usually like to break this down in terms of time. On the bottom left, with Access and Excel, these are products that can be good for small projects ranging from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Rapid application development projects usually take a couple of weeks to several months to develop, and finally these object-oriented frameworks, typically applications here will take 12 or more months to develop, and they're usually done with an entire team. The sweet spot for Apex is right there in the middle. It's aligned very closely with Oracle Forms. These are rapid application development tools that really leverage SQL and PL SQL knowledge. Now, this isn't to say that you can't use Apex for some of the enterprise-level development or even for some of the productivity-type apps. There are plenty examples of both. This is just the sweet spot. 
On the left, in line with Oracle Application Express, you see Apex Productivity Apps. And what this is, there's about 30 applications which have been developed by the Apex team at Oracle. And these are freely available for download on the Apex site. So you can get these, install them into your workspace and use them as they are. You can modify them to better meet your demands or you could just use them to learn more about Apex and how applications are built using the product. Since Apex was first released in 2004, it's undergone eight major releases, each release bringing more functionality, more stability to the product. HTMLDB was the original name of the product and it was renamed in 2006 to Application Express. Before being released as HTMLDB, it was known internally at Oracle as Project Marvel. There's another product called WebDB, which is often confused as the same product. It's actually completely different and there's no shared code between the two. Some of the features available out of the box with Apex can be seen here. And many rapid application development tools can provide widgets like you see here in the first column, such as reports, forms, and charts. Fewer will include the second column, validations to make sure data going into the database is accurate, web service integration. But how many are providing the features you see in that far column to the right? We have here translation services. If you need an application to run in multiple languages, there's support for that built into Apex. Access control, authentication, and authorization is built in as well. So there's a lot of features out of the box available within Apex. With version 3.1 of the product, we got a new tool introduced, a new report called the Interactive Report. This report is very powerful. The developer simply defines the report data, the base results that you want to allow the end user to be able to work with. And from then, the end user can manipulate the information as required rather than a developer having to deliver multiple static reports. So it's a change from the, the classic architecture where the developer has to do all the work. Ad hoc reporting can be done much easier today. And we'll take a look at an example a little later in today's demonstration. I mentioned before that because Apex is integrated in with the database, it's very easy to leverage all of the database's functionality and features. And here is just a small list of some of those features. Things like OLAP, online analytical processing, web services, and even a lot of multimedia features are just a part of Oracle and can be used with Apex. We've also seen a number of clients taking advantage of Apex to extend other Oracle products such as the eBusiness Suite. You can add functionality you might not get out of the box with some of those other products. Security, of course, is a crucial part of any application. And Apex comes out of the box with a number of pre-configured authentication schemes. Authentication is the means through which we establish the end user's identity, allow them into an application or keep them out. So there's a number of ways to do this built into the product, but there's also the opportunity, if necessary, to create custom authentication, and you can use a, a variety of methods to do that. 
once you've identified an end user, it's equally as important to control what they can or cannot do within the application, or C for that matter. And there are a number of tools available, again, out of the box within Apex. We start with authorization. You can lock down various parts, such as pages in your application, or get more granular, even buttons, for example. We also have session state protection, which is a tool that prevents what's known as URL tampering. And you could also agnostically use a lot of the database security features built into Oracle, such as fine-grained access control or VPD. When you take advantage of these tools, you don't have to do anything in Apex. So it's often best to start there. Dan, we have, we have another question in the sure. queue regarding security. Mm -hmm. uh, SQL injection, is it a safe environment against SQL injection? This is one of the safest I've seen yet. And the reason for that is, first of all, you're working in a framework when you're working with Apex. So the development team has constantly been adding more and more security features to the product. So when you start an application from scratch, such as in, in .NET or something, you, you sort of, you're concentrating on getting the base functionality to work. And, and scrambling so hard to get that functionality working, security is not really a consideration. But when using a framework such as Apex, the baseline functionality is taken care of for you. So uh, that includes the security. You don't have to worry about that on the lower levels. Now, uh, there's a number of these other features, but when it comes to SQL injection, uh, the product is very secure. And there's just two things you need to be aware of to make sure that it stays that way. Because, of course, you can extend the product as much as you need to, to to meet your needs. And when you do that, you can open yourself up for vulnerabilities. So two things you need to be aware of. One, use bind variables in your SQL queries. And two, if you're allowing the end user to input code or any kind of command that would be executed against the database, you just need to check it to make sure that it's clean. So it's very secure, and, uh, and it can be kept that way just by following those two simple techniques. And those two simple techniques, that could be said of, of really any development, web development environment. Absolutely. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Great. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Sure. Okay, what I want to take a look at next is a very common problem in, in a number of organizations. And this is because most companies use spreadsheets extensively. And it starts off innocently enough, where you create one spreadsheet to begin to collect information for a specific purpose. But eventually, you have to send that spreadsheet out to multiple people. And this is where the problem begins. From that point forward, you then have multiple sources of truth. And this, of course, will eventually require a manual merge of those sources back to a single source. But that opens up the possibility that reports could be generated from one of these partial sources of truth. Additionally, you don't really have much control over who sees the information. So while a spreadsheet is a good communication tool, it's woefully inadequate to serve as a multi-user database. People often then go over to desktop or personal databases, such as Microsoft Access. But while better than say Excel, there are a number of problems inherent in these products as well. And we start with a couple here. They're, they're fragmented. You'll have multiple uh, databases on people's computers. You might have duplication of data. They're also web unfriendly. You can't just allow access into the database via the web or browser. 
And they're also platform dependent, especially uh, Microsoft Access. It's only going to run on Microsoft. When it comes to security, you'll find that these simply don't meet the needs of today's users. You can buy a number of password cracks on the internet for most of these systems. And it's impossible to know who looked at which data and who updated certain cells and various sheets. Also, when it comes to maintenance, these can be a nightmare. Backups can be inconsistent because of the fragmented nature of these databases. You can have scattered locations, and trying to get them all backed up consistently be can become an issue. And it's really just an overall inefficient use of IT resources. The solution, in my opinion, is to leverage APEX. APEX, in fact, supports a number of different conversions. There's a direct Excel conversion, and we're going to take a look at that today. You have access conversion support built in, as well as now with version 3.2, Oracle Forms conversion support included as well. At this point, I'd like to switch over to a live demo where we'll explore the SQL Workshop and Utilities and APEX, and we'll take a look at the builder as well. We'll then create an application from a spreadsheet. I'll show you that interactive report, that powerful new report I told you about before. And finally, I'll show you how exactly you can secure the application just a little bit. But before I can do that, I need to get a couple things set up. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to turn things back over to Dave for just a minute. Great. Thanks, Dan. Dan's going to get his uh, environment set up for the demonstration, and he's going to convert the, uh, uh, the spreadsheet, as he mentioned, to an application express application, and then secure it. So re really nifty pr uh, uh, demonstration he's going to do for us. Uh, while he's getting set up, I just wanted to take a quick second and uh, point out some things that are coming up that may be of interest to you or your staffs. Uh, in addition to training, and you can see the uh, classes that are, are listed on our class calendar now, uh, in addition to this training, which we can do online, you can see the schedule here, we can bring these classes to your company. And if you have a group of four, five, six people or more, that's usually the best way to, to do that. Um, but we're also very active in, in, in with many customers in helping them with their uh, projects. Uh, so if you have any uh, projects uh, that are uh, in need of some consulting help, uh, we can help you there. Perhaps a forms to application express migration, uh, EBS integration, or just a uh, from the ground up uh, Oracle application express development effort. We can help with all of those things. Everything from full life cycle application development. Uh, to just actually micro-mentoring sessions, uh, code reviews, uh, making sure you're on the right track. We can do that remotely. We can do that on site. So many customers are finding this very, very helpful. And uh, in today's economic times, um, you know, uh, affordable as well. So keep this in mind for all of these things. And we hope that you'll uh, take some of these classes too. We can teach you Application Express. If you need PL SQL pro, uh, programming experience, we can help with that. Uh, SQL, uh, HTML, uh, the whole gamut. So uh, keep us in mind for all of those things if you would. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Dan, are you ready to, uh, to start your demonstration? Ready to go. OK, I'm going to pass things back over to you. And thank you very much. Okay. So I mentioned before how APEC is broken down into workspaces. And what you see now is the login screen for workspace. So this is where a developer comes in to begin working with an APEX. Okay. 
So this is the Workspace homepage. And as you can see, there are three main icons here, as well as three main tabs that correspond to the icons. And these are the three main parts of Apex. We first have the Application Builder. And this is where you, as a developer, will spend the majority of your time. That's where you'll create applications, pages within them, and all the various functionality you need. Additionally, we have the SQL Workshop. And this is similar to products like Toad or, say, SQL Developer. It's a tool to allow you to work with the underlying database objects. If you have one of those other tools, it's probably a better tool, but if you ever needed a web-based method to work with the database that's integrated with the product. And finally, we have a number of utilities which um, do a variety of things. And we're grouped over into that third-part utilities. And that's what we'll take a look first here now. So these are the utilities built into the database. And I'll start, we'll just start at the top and work through them all. Uh, data load and unload. This is a tool you can use to either import or export data from various tables in the database. If you need to generate the DDL associated with some of the underlying database objects, this tool can be used to do so very easily. So you can move objects from one environment to another. Object reports. If you need to get some information about the database objects, you can do that here access to the recycle bin. For those of you who don't know, in Oracle, when you drop a table, m uh, more than likely, it's not truly been dropped. It's gone into what's known as the recycle bin, and it can be recovered. And you can go into the recycle bin here to do that. The database monitor here and about database are very similar. These are just utilities that give you some information about the underlying database. The Apex Views, also known as the Apex Repository, provide a lot of insight into your applications. Remember that your applications in Apex are really just, it's just metadata stored in a number of Oracle tables. These views can provide access to that data. And you can run reports against it. Uh, a useful example uh, of taking advantage of this is to ensure consistency throughout your applications. So say you wanted to make sure that all labels for various items ended with a semicolon, you could run a report against these views to ensure that that is, in fact, the case. And finally, there's a tool here to compare two different schemas within the database. Say if you had a test and development environment and you wanted to make sure that they were the same, you could use this schema comparison tool to do that. So those are the utilities. And next, I'll move into the SQL Workshop. So if Apex is broken down into three main parts, the SQL Workshop is further divided into four different parts. We have first the Object Browser, which allows you to see and work with underlying database objects. So you can click on a table, for example, and view information about the table here, such as its column names and their data types. You can also view the underlying data here. See how this table relates to other tables and do a variety of other functions. So that's the SQL Workshop or at least the, the object browser, rather. We also have here SQL commands. And this is a lot like SQL Plus, if you're familiar with that tool, only web-based. Here you can type ad hoc queries. And then view the results of the query down below. There's also the ability using SQL scripts to both create or upload scripts, which can then be executed against the database. And finally, for those of you who are not too familiar with SQL, 
There's a graphical query builder tool which you can use to generate queries for you. So rather than select star from countries, you can just come here, click on the table, and maybe how it, uh, the columns you'd like to see in the query. If you'd like to add another table, such as the regions table, you can do that here and then join the two together. And once you have the query set up the way you like, you can click on Run and view the results to make sure that things are coming back the way you'd like them. If so, you can save it or just view the SQL and use that wherever you like. So that's the SQL Workshop. I'm going to go back to the Workspace homepage. And before we go into the Application Builder, I wanted to show you another part of an Apex workspace, and that's the internal user repository. We've been talking a lot about security, and this is where it really starts. I click on Manage Application Express Users. I go into the user repository, and here you can see that there are two users, and uh, on the right, you can see what the color of each user means. Uh, red is a workspace administrator. Yellow would be just a developer. These two have access to the, the back, the part we're seeing now, the actual workspace. There's another type of user which is just an end user. They could never get logged into a workspace, but they could at least run applications and get logged in to the results uh, which you create in a workspace. What I want to do is create a user that we're going to use later for testing. Call him John Doe. And I'm going to change just one setting here. The default is a developer. I'll change that from a yes to a no. And that's how we make this user simply an end user. Click on Create. And you can see that user now here. Also note that there's a Groups tab if you wanted to use Groups to determine what various users within the internal user repository can do. You can certainly do that here. Dan, a question in the queue, if I may. Sure. Um, you created John Doe as a user. Is, is, is John Doe also a user in the Oracle database? So if I went to DBA users and did a query there, would I see John Doe? No. Absolutely not. This is just the internal user repository, uh, and it's independent with each workspace in, in Apex. Uh -huh. Now, having said that, if you would prefer to use existing Oracle database users, you can certainly do that. This is just a tool if you don't have another means uh, for authentication. So additionally, uh, if you'd like, if you use Active Directory in your organization, rather than having to store usernames and credentials in multiple locations, you can leverage those other platforms. Did that answer the question? I think it did. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. You're welcome. All right. So now we have our users. Also note the admin user. I could just switch this user to an end user as well. I just want you to, to remember we have two end users, one I'm calling admin and the other JDO. Okay, let's go back to the Workspace homepage and now I'll finally go into the Application Builder. And here we see all of the applications stored within this particular workspace. If I click on the name of an application, I go down one level deeper, and I go to what's known as the application homepage. From here we have another a number of icons across the top. I can run this application by clicking this one. Listed below are all of the pages of the current application. 
So this particular application has a total of 24 pages. And when you click on the name of a page, you go down one level deeper to what's known as the edit page screen. There's a lot of information here, but don't be overwhelmed. This particular page is broken down into three columns. We have page rendering, page processing, and then for convenience, the shared components column. Now page rendering is essentially what's on the page. In a page we have various regions and we can add buttons and items. Items could be select lists or any other type of item you often see in web-based applications. And there could be some associated computations and processes that are run on load. When a user clicks a button, such as submit, that's when we get into this second column, page processing. We may run some validations to make sure that the, the information the user has entered meets our requirements, and some processes which could then save the information back to the database. And finally, branches are used to go to the next page. The shared components column on the right is simply here for convenience. Shared components are just different parts of the application that can be used from the application on down. So they could be used by various pages, by regions, or items used throughout. And these are just convenient links that take us directly to that particular shared component. So these are some of the most important pages you'll be working with while you're developing Apex applications. I can show you the shared components here. They're broken down into eight categories. Some of the most important ones, navigation. These are the various tools you have available to you to allow your end users to navigate your applications. Tools like tabs and breadcrumbs are very common in web-based applications. I mentioned before security. This is where you can get to the various security options within Apex. We talked about how you could, there's built-in translation support, if that's a requirement. So there's a number of things here in the shared components. At this point, I'm going to go back to the Application Builder homepage, where we see that listing of all of the applications in this workspace. And I'm going to go to create a new application. When creating a new application, you have three choices. You can install one of two different demonstration applications. You can see that they're both already installed. You can reinstall them or remove them. More often than not, you'll be using this first option, which allows you to create an application from scratch. But sometimes you'll find it very convenient to create an application from a spreadsheet. And that's the option we're going to use today. So we're going to upload the file. And notice it's the CSV format. So if you have it right now as an XLS, you'll need to first save that file as a CSV before you can create an application from it. Here we can browse and upload that file. And before we do, I want to show you the file we're working with. So this is the employees XLS. And here it is. As you can see, it's a very standard Excel sheet used for maintaining employee-related information. The first row are just column headers, and from rows two on down, just the actual data. So this is what we will be converting into an Apex application today. As I mentioned, the first step would be saving this under other formats as a CSV file. And you'll see that here, comma delimited. I've already done that. And you can see that file here. So I'll select that and click on Open. 
And next, we just specify the separator and optional enclosure, which is usually the double quote. We're checked on first row contains column names, and you'll see why when we click Next. So first, this file is uploaded, and Apex takes a look at the contents of the file and takes us to a screen where we're actually setting various attributes for a table that Apex will be creating for us. So we're moving that data from a standard Excel sheet into an Oracle table. Here I can specify the table name. And notice below we have a number of columns. Apex just looked through all of this. And it looked at that first row. Said, okay, I'm going to use these for the various column names. It also associated a data type with each column. And Apex does a pretty good job of this. Not, notice that salary was set to a number because all other rows contain numeric data for that particular column. Date of birth, though, it didn't get quite right. It thinks it's a var char or character data. So what I'll do, I'll manually set this to date, and then we can specify the date format here. And this is a typical month, 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 day, year date format. Everything else looks good, so from here we can continue on. specify the singular or plural name for the data we're working with. And if we want to at this point, we can change the various labels which will be used for the items that will be created and the columns that will be used in the report. I'll leave the defaults. If we like, we can do various summarizations. Uh, I'm going to skip that part. And then finally, here, we can choose the report implementation. You could choose to do a classic report. And that's what the SQL reports were essentially renamed to when the interactive report was introduced in version 3.1. But I want to show you the features of the interactive report, so I'll leave that. And here we can select the theme, or the look and feel, we'd like to use for our application. There are 20 built-in themes. Theme 19 was specifically developed for mobile applications. So if you're using or, or need a mobile application, theme 19 can get you a nice jump start. But for today, I'm going to go with theme 8. Dan, a question in the queue, if I could. Sure. Um, re with respect to themes, can you build your own theme? Absolutely. In fact, a number of organizations do take the time to do that. They create uh, a corporate theme. And what's really convenient about Apex is that you can take these corporate themes, these custom themes, and you can actually add those to the repository we were just looking at. And once you do that, Anyone who's then creating an, app, an application in the future can choose that corporate theme, and you can have a very consistent look and feel with all your applications and an organization. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll create the app. And when it's finished, we're taken back to that application homepage I showed you earlier for another application. So here we can see the pages in the application. And there's a total of five. We have a report page. That's where we're going to find the interactive report. And we have two form pages, one used for new data coming in and another used to update existing data. And we'll see why they're different. And there's a success page. If you successfully insert a new record, you'll be taken to this page. And finally, we have a login page. When I run the application, notice that I'm not able just to get right into the app. I'm taken 
to that login page. So by default, we're using the internal user repository for authentication. And of course, it's very easy to change that to any number of other authentication options, but for now, this will work fine. I'm going to log in as that admin user I created earlier. So the credentials were good. It allows me into the app. And this is the interactive report. Standard report, we can add filters. We'll look at some of the more advanced functionality in just a little bit, but we added a filter and it says row text contains king. So we only see those rows. And when I click on the edit button here on the left, we're taken to another page entirely. It's that form page I had mentioned before. We see that the form is pre-populated with that row's data. I can modify it and send the changes back to the database or move to various records using the buttons at the bottom. If I click the Create button, that takes me to the Create form, which is null and ready for user input. A couple of the features available within the interactive report. You saw a basic filter that I could add up here. If I didn't want to search across the entire row, I could use this drop down here and first select the column I'd like to search and then just search that one particular column. You'll see that it looks a little bit different now. It says the department contains the text. You can toggle filters on or off, but leave them in the report by using the checkbox. Or get rid of them entirely by clicking on the red X. On the right, we have what's known as the action menu. When I click that, we have a variety of other options we can use in an interactive report. If I don't like all of the columns that are being displayed or the order in which they're displayed, I can use select columns to change that. If, for example, I wasn't concerned with the username, I could send that to the left side and I wouldn't see it anymore. And if, to me, I preferred seeing the last name first, I can move that to the top. When I click Apply, notice the username column is gone and last name is now displayed first. Next option down is filter. You saw me add some basic filters using the top part, but when I select the filter option from the action menu, we can add some more complex filters. So we have the column we're working with, the operator we'd like to apply, and then the expression. And this is context sensitive. So in the case of this column, which is a text column, first name, look at the operators we have available. These are operators that work with text data. But if I switch that to something like salary, which is numeric, notice we have different operators, operators that work with numeric data. And again, if I switch it to a date column, completely different operators that work with dates. So you can add more complex filters using that. I think I'm seeing a date picker there as well, Dan. That's correct, yep, built in. get this little pop-up where you can select the date. That's great. We also have the ability to apply sorts. Most reports, including this one, allow you to click on a column name and use arrows to sort by that particular column. This one does allow you to do that as well, but uh, we can get more complex again by going to the action menu where you see that we can actually apply multiple sorts, up to six. So say we could first apply a sort across the last name and then the first name, and we can also control the direction as well as how we'd like to treat null values. So that's a nice feature. Control breaks can be used to create a nice separation, a visual break of data in the report. 
So if I wanted to view employees by the department, I could apply control break on that column. And notice the department column here. When I click apply, that column is removed from the main part of the report and brought up to the top. And now we can see employees grouped together by department. And again, I can toggle that on or off. All the options that are added here are treated the same. Next one down is highlight. You have the ability to highlight rows of information based on a condition you set here below. So if I look at the salary column, I can see that we have a um, pretty good divide. I'd say anyone making over $10,000 here is doing pretty good. And maybe I'd like to see that. So I'll create a, a highlight. I'm just going to give it a name. And what you're doing here, you're selecting the background color. And then the text color. And finally, the condition specifies when this highlight should be used. So I want to work with the salary column. And I'm going to say is greater than or equal to. And notice the expression actually looks inside that column. I'll just pick something, say 8,000. We'll apply that. Should have changed the name, but you can get the basic idea here. Notice if they do not meet the condition, it's not highlighted, but those that do are, in fact, highlighted. Turn that off for now. Next one is compute. Oftentimes, you want to maybe work with a, a column, or you wish that a, a column existed that doesn't, and you can actually use the compute option to add columns like that. Works a bit like a calculator, but you can add new columns. I think we're running short on time, so I'm going to have to move a little quicker. Uh, I can show you the chart ability. Picture's worth a 1,000 words, so if I wanted, for example, to view this data as a chart. I'll select the pie chart. And let's say I want to see the average salary by department. The label I could use, I could select department. The value will use salary. And the function, of course, I want to see the average, so we'll use that. And I'll click Apply. And here we can see those values. So we've seen uh, just a couple of the features. There's some more here available. But that's the interactive report, a very powerful tool since version 3.1. Now, I also wanted to show you some of the built-in security features. So let me take you back to the normal report. And let's say the salary column is one that we consider to be secure. So I'm going to show you how we can lock that down. I'll do that first by going to the application homepage and into those shared components I showed you earlier. On the left, under security, I see authorization schemes. And this is what we'll use to lock various parts of our application down. Right now, I don't have an authorization scheme. I'm going to create a new one from scratch. And I'll call it is admin, something indicative of what I'll be using this for. The type, I'm going to use a PL SQL function returning Boolean. And a simple expression here. So app user is an internal Apex variable that's going to have the value of the currently logged in user. So I'm just checking to see that app user is admin. Remember, we have an admin user and another user named jdoe. So this will return true if the user is the admin. Finally, I just need to specify an error message if that check fails. And I can also specify if I want this to run for every page or just once for an entire session. I'll create that. And now we have an authorization scheme, but I've not yet used it. So let me go back into the edit page screen where we have the interactive report. And I can see under Regions, here's the interactive report. And I'm going to click on that report. 
And here I see a listing of all the columns used in the report. I can click on the Edit button here. And I'm going to drill down or focus on authorization. And there's a select list here that allows me to select that is admin authorization scheme I just, I just created. So I'll apply that. And now that's locked down. I'll run the page. And because I'm logged in as the admin user, I do, in fact, see this. Let me log out. And I'll log back in now as JDO. As you can see, JDO is not able to view that column. It's not hidden and select columns. It's simply not available to this particular user. These authorization schemes can be applied very granularly, granularly as you've just seen at the column level, or to entire pages. There's a lot you can do with those. And, the, and here's where a little knowledge of PL SQL programming starts to come into play. Would that be fair to say, Dan? Absolutely. Yep. So once you want to get a little bit more sophistication in the application, you, you, you really want your, your, your PL SQL programmers to be involved. Sure. Good suggestion. I think that's about all the time I have for now. So I'm going to switch back here. Going forward, uh, if you have uh, an interest in, in APEX and you'd like to learn more about it, you can go to apex.oracle.com where you can, uh, if you notice in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link here to sign up for an account. APEX, uh, or I should say Oracle, has a hosted version of APEX where you can get a free account and test the product, learn how to use it. usually takes a couple of hours after you request the account to get your login credentials. Uh, and there's a number of other links here on this page for more information. And that's all the time we have for today, folks. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, there's some contact information here for Gary if you have any interest in Apex at all. Well, great. Thank you very much, Dan. That was excellent and very informative. Uh, folks, I would like to remind you if... Um, we can help you with some training needs, some consulting needs, some mentoring, or uh, even some uh, application development, uh, please give us a call. The contact information you see on the screen is for Gary Belke in our main office. And uh, Gary's there basically 24 hours a day, and we'll answer your calls. So I can get back to you right away. Well, thank you very much for attending today's session, and uh, we hope to see you next week at next week's session. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks again, Dan. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.